Thanks for having me, and I hope everyone can hear me all right. Um, my name is Melissa Gentry, and I've worked here. I'm actually in the map collection tonight. I don't know if you can see the drawers behind me of maps. Um, and we have about 140,000 maps in this collection. And the fun thing for me, the, one of the biggest perks of my job is I get to create new maps um, about all different topics. And my favorite topic is women's history. So um, the women's suffrage centennial is a great opportunity for me to create some new maps. And originally, um, I started creating one map of Indiana suffrage history, but the more research that I've done, I've come up with more and more women so that now the one map is actually multiple maps <laughs> that have um, kind of like themes about them. So at the end, I'll, I'll get everyone's email address so I can send you the links to the online map so you can see those. Um, I basically just created a PowerPoint to show you some of the people that I've found tonight. So I'll switch over to my PowerPoint here for you. One second. There we go. Can everyone see that? I'm assuming you can see. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so basically, um, Gloria Steinem um, was at Ball State last fall, and she uh, gave us a good reminder that women have always been a part of history, and they've always been a part of making history, but they haven't always been a part of making the history books. So I always thought that was a really good line. And there's so many stories, especially re related to women's suffrage, that are untold. Um, and there are lots of challenges, unfortunately, to researching women in history. Um, just starting, first of all, with their names. A lot of times a woman goes by her husband's name. And so a lot of, um, you'll have to search in a city directory or find obituaries of that husband to find out what his wife's first name is, things like that. Um, even in the obituaries, which are typically written by their families, um, the woman's accomplishments aren't always mentioned. Um, I learned that with a woman in Muncie who she was a, a big leader in women's suffrage and in World War I charities. And when she died, it, it only mentioned who her family was in her obituary. But it also mentioned that her pallbearers were the mayor of Muncie, the president of Ball State, and two of the Ball brothers here in Muncie. So that was a clue that she had done things, but even her own family didn't write her accomplishments. So those are kind of some of the struggles. And there's hardly ever any photographs either. So. Um, some of the photographs that I found tonight, um, I was pretty excited to find in the Historical Society and here at Ball State, we um, found some photographs. So that was kind of, those are kind of the, the struggles. But so tonight, I basically just wanted it to be a celebration of some of those untold stories. And some of the resources that I used um, were the League of Women Voters, uh, Dr. Anita Morgan at IUPUI. She has a kind of all-inclusive um, women's suffrage in Indiana book that I'll be telling you more about. The Indiana Historical Bureau, they have a really great web page and blog and also podcast um, that gave me a lot of information. I use the Indiana Historical Society and lots of local historical societies and libraries and archives across the state. And if you're interested, the Library of Congress has a really great collection um, of photographs all about women's suffrage. So you might want to check that out online. It's all available online. So the Seneca Falls Convention, uh, it was the Women's Rights Convention. It actually occurred in 1848. And many marked that as the beginning of the suffrage movement. Um, that's where they issued the Declaration of Women's Rights. Um, but when Abigail Adams famously wrote to her husband to, quote, remember the ladies, she wasn't asking for something that was revolutionary, pardon the pun. Instead, though, the new constitution allowed individual states to establish who could vote. So even though women's suffrage in America typically starts at Seneca, it was actually being requested way back during the revolutionary times. And this program tonight features newspaper reports from the time. So I'm going to start with a quote from the Muncie Morning News. Quote, indeed, the women, in spite of press and ridicule, have stormed a good many well-manned well forts and broken down a good many prejudices. They've reached the Rubicon of their hopes, that is suffrage at the polls. 
and there's no doubt that they will cross this before another half decade pass. We may pretty safely count on the woman's vote in the second or third presidential canvas. We should not be surprised if it became a factor in the next two elections. It only concerns us that the inevitable is not far off. Unfortunately, that quote is from the Muncie Morning News from January 21st, 1880. So it would not be four years for women to get the vote. It would not happen in the second or third presidential canvas. As they mentioned, it would be 40 years. Um, so women's suffrage in Indiana and elsewhere was definitely not inevitable. In fact, in Indiana, the pioneering women actually began demanding, demanding women's rights before the Civil War. Frances Wright, who's on the top left corner, she was a friend of the Marquis de Lafayette, and she called the Declaration of Independence her Holy Bible. And she was publicly speaking out on behalf of women's rights in New Harmony, Indiana, in the 1820s. And mobilized by the spunky activist from Winchester, Indiana, Amanda Way, men and women in Indiana actually organized a women's rights association only three years after Seneca Falls in 1851. And in 1859, three Indiana suffragists proudly appeared before the state legislature with a petition of 1,000 women who wanted the vote. So the suffrage history in Indiana, as you can see, goes way back. And Indiana had visitors like Sojourner Truth, Anna Dickinson, Lucy Stone, Lucretia Mott, and they all visited the state and, and spoke for women's rights. Susan B. Anthony is probably the best known women's suffrage leader. And after the Civil War, she began traveling across the country advocating for a woman's right to vote. She visited Indiana a number of times, but in the fall of 1887, she actually organized meetings of the National Women's Suffrage Association in each of the state's congressional districts. So this map is a map that I made that shows the, the places where she visited. So these are the cities that can actually claim Susan B. Anthony was here. And as early as 1897, she addressed a joint session of the Indiana legislature to request the women's suffrage movement to the US Constitution. But war and epidemic opposition from breweries, especially in places like Jasper, clergymen, and obviously male politicians sidetracked and postponed crossing that, quote, Rubicon of the suffragist hopes. But a big part of the battle was also changing the opinions of newspapers, who then would change the opinions of readers, who were also known as voters. In fact, the newspapers back in the early times actually mocked the idea of women voting. From the South Bend Tribune, this is a, a quote, there's going to be trouble at the polls, too. No nice woman is going to cast her vote disturbed by the fear that her hat is crooked or her hair is out of curl. And it's going to cost a lot of money to fit up each booth with a looking glass, gas jet, curling iron, and powder box. So in this section, I wanted to feature some of the stories that I've discovered, some of these true characters who were battling for the ballot in Indiana. And Indiana has always been a conservative state. Um, so many of the suffragists were only comfortable with very polite, um, quote, ladylike tactics of protests, but some of the women from Indiana were true rabble rousers. And luckily, uh, I am going to cover dozens of women tonight, but luckily for you, there's not going to be a quiz, so you don't have to remember their names. But just to give you some, I just wanted to tell you about some of the stories, because I think it's kind of surprising. I think you'll be really surprised by some of the Indiana women who were there in the room where it happened, um, where history happened, related to uh, American women's suffrage. So we're actually gonna start with an interloper from Illinois, Virginia Brooks. She was from Chicago and she actually inherited real estate in West Hammond, which is a city that straddles the Indiana-Illinois line. Technically a resident of Illinois, she became a sensation in Indiana for the cause of suffrage but she first set forth on a crusade to improve her hometown by ridding it of vice. Called the Joan of Arc of West Hammond, Brooks learned the Polish language and became an advocate for housing, labor, legal, and voting rights. The newspaper actually reported that unless she is killed, she will succeed at cleaning up her city. 
Her fighting tactics made Brooks a sensation. At the first Women's Franchise League convention in Indianapolis in April of 1912, the Indianapolis News wrote, quote, the woman who easily attracted the most attention at the convention of the Women's Franchise League was Miss Virginia Brooks, the fighting taxpayer of West Hammond. She looks more like a high school girl than the general of a Polish army, unquote. She told reporters that suffrage was critical so that women like her could be elected mayor of their hometowns. Brooks also spoke at the Equal Suffrage Association mass meeting in Indianapolis with over 2,000 in attendance. The Equal Suffrage Club of Logansport wanted to hire Virginia Brooks to speak at one of their meetings, but they couldn't afford her speaking fee. Brooks charged a dollar per minute and she would not commit to not speaking over 25 minutes. So the Logansport Club canceled her visit um, and $25 today would be about $650 in 1912. So later that April in 1912, Brooks ran for president of the school board in West Hammond and her election and the unladylike events of that day made national news. Brooks's female supporters spent the, days at the, the day at the polls, encouraging voters to elect Brooks to office. However, when Hammond resident Julius Lesner appeared at the voting site, tension and violence escalated between the parties. According to an article in the Interocean, which was a Chicago newspaper, Lesner, quote, delivered himself of a few personal views of the election to a crowd of voters. The views did not meet with the approval of the suffragists. In an instant, a score of Amazonian guards surrounded the man and physically expressed their sentiments in the matter. In about three minutes, all that was left of Mr. Lesner that was recognizable were a few weak efforts at resistance and a vociferous repetition of the same political views he had previously expressed. Not satisfied that they had materially changed the man's appearance, the women then bodily carried him off and hurled him into a ditch of water. So Miss Brooks easily defeated the other contestants in that election, receiving 300 out of the 500 votes that were polled. News of Brooks' victory and the actions of her bold supporters reached newspapers throughout the Midwest, but it also spread to papers on both coasts, including San Francisco, which summarized the events of the day. Quote, the day was replete with exciting incidents from the time the polls opened until they closed, and in every case, the feminine supporters of Miss Brooks came out victorious. Another woman who became a national leader in women's suffrage is Ida Houston Harper. Ida Houston Harper was one of seven girls who qualified in 1868 to graduate in the first class at Muncie Central Academy. None of the boys in the class qualified, by the way. She ultimately wrote for newspapers and Harper would go on to lead the publicity department for the National Suffrage Organization sending articles to newspapers that actually helped change the country's opinion about women voting. She was so critical to the movement because she got the newspapers to change their opinions about women's suffrage, and yet she's rarely mentioned in suffrage books. But she co-wrote the history of women's suffrage with Susan B. Anthony and was chosen by Anthony to write her biography. Harper was feisty and outspoken, but she was also very conservative in her thinking, and she didn't mince words when criticizing younger women about not their dedication to the cause, but their fashions. Harper was working on suffrage in New York in 1911. Here's part of an article that appeared in the Richmond, Indiana newspaper that year about Harper's opinions on suffragist fashions. Quote, nothing has done so much harm to suffrage in the last 50 years as the way women have dressed or undressed. No woman who enters a great movement can allow herself the same freedom she enjoyed before. She's no longer responsible merely as an individual. She is the embodiment of the cause that she represents. If she's a suffragist, whatever silly thing she does is charged up to suffrage by men. Their hats alone have made them the laughing stock of the country. These ridiculous objects are without excuse in their shape or trimming. The most influential women have worn dresses on the street and in public that in places that have exposed figures, arms, bosoms, and ankles in so shameless a way that one is forced to suspect that if they have appeared modest in the past, it was only because custom demanded it 
and not from any innate refinement, unquote. <laughs> and speaking of fashion, another Indiana suffrage leader and journalist who made her mark was Esther Griffin White of Richmond, Indiana. George Blakey described Esther in the Indiana Magazine of History, quote, as early as 19. 1915, Esther smoked publicly and criticized those who disapproved. Her fashion sense was either a step ahead or behind contemporary styles. Her skirts were either shorter or longer, and her hats were either larger or smaller than those worn by other women of the time. She often affected a masculine look abetted by a cane in the manner of a swagger stick. Her opinions were firm, her wit caustic, her temper volatile, she demanded cooperation, favors, and applause, yet her self-conscious detachment made her appear aloof and unfriendly, unquote. At one of the Women's Franchise League state conventions in Indianapolis, a furious debate erupted about whether the group should issue a resolution stating their opposition to the more militant and extreme tactics of British suffragettes, like em Emmeline Pankhurst. Mostly, they wanted to show this opposition just to reassure offended men. When Esther Griffin White was called upon to express her views, she told the women that they pay far too much attention to the opinion of men. Quote, what difference does it make what the men think? If they get in the way, crack them over the head, unquote. Emmeline Pankhurst and her daughter Sylvia visited Indiana to encourage suffragists in their battle for the ballot. Harriet Noble of Indianapolis on the left and Harriet McClellan of Muncie are examples of two Indiana women who protested alongside the suffragettes in England. After meeting and demonstrating with the Pankhurst, both Harriets, much like National Women's Party leader Alice Paul, became inspired and dedicated leaders for the cause of suffrage here in the United States. At the National Suffrage Day in Muncie in 1914, School teacher Harriet McClellan addressed one of the men's gripes about women getting the vote. She explained why women would not neglect their duties in the home just because they gained the vote. Quote, even if she only voted once a year, she would have 364 days to attend to her home. Unquote. Another suffrage leader from Indiana was Mary, nicknamed Molly Garrett Hay, from Charlestown, Indiana. Hay began fighting for women's suffrage in 1896 when California was creating its state constitution. She became an efficient organizer and worked with national leader Carrie Chapman Catt, traveling to conventions, creating citizenship classes, and leading the New York Equal, Equal Suffrage League from 1910 to 1918, enrolling thousands of women to vote. She was also a strong supporter of the League of Women Voters following ratification. Indiana was also home to many African-American suffrage leaders. In 1912, African-American women were organizing for the cause of suffrage, though this would not be the first time Black women participated in Indiana. Notes from the Women's Suffrage Association in 1869 mention an African-American woman asking about being involved in the cause. This new branch, number seven of the Equal Suffrage Association in 1912, was founded in the home of successful entrepreneur, Madam C.J. Walker. Madam C.J. Walker was friends with Mary Church Terrell and other national activists, so her support for suffrage was no surprise. In Muncie, when the Booker T. Washington Franchise League was organized in the spring of 1917, they helped mobilize a citywide re voter registration drive. When their officers hosted a meeting in the black neighborhood called Whiteley, Women and men there founded another franchise league. Josephine Pearson was an example of these African-American suffragists in Muncie. She was a mother, a wife, active in her church charities, worked sometimes two jobs, and volunteered her service at the YWCA and the Red Cross during World War I. Betiola Fortson was a shining star of Indiana suffrage a published author, poet, and successful milliner from Evansville, she moved to Chicago and served as the vice president of the African American Alpha Suffrage Club, founded by uh, Ida B. Wells Barnett, who was a mentor and mother figure to Batiola. This was the first African American suffrage club in the country 
And it was this club that sent a large delegation to the suffrage parade in Washington, D.C. in 1913. Unfortunately, Betty Ola was just getting started when she died from tuberculosis in 1917. Another gone too soon tragedy struck one of the unladylike characters of the suffrage movement in Indiana just a few years after she was emerging as a leader. A popular speaker was a young woman from Logansport named Sage Bell Fenton. She graduated from Vassar College in 1911 and was editor of the Logansport Times newspaper. She was an enthusiastic advocate for women's suffrage and helped organize the local franchise league. Called an active warrior for the vote, Sage hosted a public debate between herself and a Purdue professor. She published a special suffrage edition of the newspaper after first ditching a beer ad that she discovered in it, and she was making speeches around the state in 1915. She also served as vice president of the Women's Press Club of Indiana and joined the state publicity committee for the Franchise League. Unfortunately, Sage drowned in St. Augustine in April of 1916 at the age of 27. Indianapolis suffragist Grace Julian Clark eulogized Sage as, quote, a rare combination of the idealistic and the practical, unquote. And I think that also serves as a fitting description for all suffragists, idealistic and practical. Some of the tactics implemented by the suffragists were very inventive. In 1912, the Women's Franchise League and the Equal Suffrage Association were determined to create spectacle and excitement for the cause. Women drivers were one way to draw attention, and who doesn't love a parade? Dr. Anita Morgan writes about the phenomena of suffragists using automobiles for their cause in her book, we Must Be Fearless, The Woman's Suffrage Movement in Indiana. Quote, women reporters and photographers joined suffragists in the field. Sometimes the street meeting followed an automobile tour as suffragists stood in cars, brightly decorated with yellow suffrage banners and delivered their messages to the assembled crowds. Suffrage parades also caught everyone's attention and made for great newspaper stories, unquote. This story actually involves a trip to Hamilton County which was apparently quite the expedition from Indianapolis back in 1912. Dr. Morgan continues, Sarah Lauter, an Indianapolis suffragist and soprano, offered the use of her car. And a few days later on June 5th, 1912, five members of the Women's Franchise League made a flying trip through Hamilton County to Westfield and Noblesville for the first such tour of the state. Grace Julian Clark, Mrs. Harry Miller, Julia Henderson, Mrs. W.T. Barnes, and the car owner, Sarah Lauder, made the trip. The goal was to, quote, venture into territory where women are not actively demanding the right to vote, unquote. After leaving Indianapolis around 9.30 a.m., the suffragists held meetings and distributed, liber distributed literature throughout the area. Their meeting at the Westfield Public Library included a crowd of men and women, a luncheon, and rousing speeches by suffragists. Announcing a good day's work, three women, Mrs. Inno Stanbrow, Mrs. Anna Stevens, and Lizzie Tressmeyer, organized a Westfield Woman Franchise League branch and offered to organize one in Carmel. A women's club meeting was happening when the suffrage sedan arrived in Noblesville, so the savvy suffragists passed out literature in the street. Then they passed out more flyers in Allisonville on their way home. More from Anita Morgan. The next tour would be in Boone County. Mary Winter and Celeste Barnhill, accompanied by reporter Betty Blythe, addressed a group at the Christian Church in Zionsville. Even the pastor became a supporter, but a branch was not formed. Blythe believed that the opposition in, was in part from the apathy of the women themselves. Then Winter and Barnhill took over their, took their votes for women car to the courthouse in Lebanon, where speeches involved labor issues, vice, and liquor traffic. Again, no branch was formed, but a future meeting was planned. Meanwhile, the Equal Suffrage Association would not be outshined, and another suffragist legend would be born. Anna Dunn Noland of Logansport had organized the local Equal Suffrage Association 
and was state president for 13 years. She was a public relations genius. Posters and banners declaring votes for women were posted on barns and billboards, and she mailed hundreds of announcements to women's clubs across the state, each one addressed by hand. And pamphlets were dropped from a Zeppelin airship to the people of Logansport, telling them about her upcoming spectacular event. So on June 30th, 1912, thousands turned out for a parade following their suffrage convention. From the history of women's suffrage, it stated that over 50,000 people watched the suffragists parade through the streets of Logansport and every business house was beautifully dressed in suffrage colors. More than 100 automobiles were in line and a number of floats were paraded by business firms. Two bands, a platoon of police, and the city fire department headed the parade. Miss Ruth Hildebrandt, a winsome miss of 18, mounted on a big black horse, was marshal of the parade. Another big parade was being planned for Washington, D.C. Alice Paul and Lucy Burns planned a national suffrage parade in the nation's capital on March 3rd, 1913, the day before President Wilson's inauguration. The New York Times headline the day before the march read, women start invasion. And the US Capitol appeared to be under siege by women who had descended in droves. Here's a colorized photograph of the march that um, PBS, the docuseries The Vote, um, published these colorized um, photographs that you can view online um, of the, the march in Washington, D.C. in 1913. A literal army of suffragists actually marched all the way from New York for the parade, and other women arrived on horseback. The Indianapolis Star wrote, quote, they included old women, young women, fat women, slim women, grandfathers, papas, sweethearts, and several young children, unquote. The Indianapolis News bragged quality over quantity, but the Indianapolis Star wrote about the disappointingly small Indiana delegation. Quote, the Indiana section of the parade had no organization and none had any idea how many women from the state would march until the formation began. The Indiana women were in the seventh division at the rear of the parade, unquote. Only 10 women from Indiana were marching. Our suffragette, Harriet Noble, and Mary Hote Tarkington Jameson of Indianapolis carried the Indiana banner. Hote Jameson was from a prominent Indiana family. James Whitcomb Riley actually tried to court her, and her baby brother was Pulitzer Prize winning author Booth Tarkington. Indiana Senator, Senator Albert Beveridge's wife, Catherine Eddy Beveridge, Beveridge, also marched in the parade, but she was no ordinary senator's wife. Catherine Eddy's family was extremely wealthy and powerful in Chicago. Her customary debut in 1902 was extraordinary because she was actually presented as a debutante to 1,500 guests at the court of Tsar Nicholas II in Moscow and she was marching for Indiana in the parade. Other members of the Indiana delegation were Mary Trimble and a Miss Connor from Indianapolis, Mrs. B.F. Snyder of Liberty, Rachel Kirkham Harris of Sullivan, Eva Martin of South Bend, Laura Millspaugh from the Chesterfield Spiritualist Camp, and our Logan Support Parade organizer, Anna Dunn Nolan. And typically for the times when Nolan returned to Indiana after marching in this historic parade, the press interviewed her about the most pressing suffrage issue, her opinion of the new straight slit skirt worn by some of the suffragists. She said, quote, I can see nothing wrong about the slit skirt. I think all the evil lies in the mind of the beholder, unquote. So that background about the prominence of the women in the Indiana Parade delegation is intriguing because of the events that happened at that parade. The day started as a beautiful parade with pageantry and women dressed in white and a tableau with goddesses performing at the Treasury Building. The parade began without incident 
but after the first few blocks, the crowd of 100,000 men in town for the inauguration, many of them drunk, began surrounding the marchers, and the parade quickly turned violent. The hostile mob insulted, tripped, shoved, spat on, and grabbed the women, who were forced at times to walk single file through a gauntlet. So again, you can imagine that Indiana delegation having to face this crowd of rowdy men. Ambulances were constantly rescuing women for about six hours, but even their path was obstructed. Over 300 marchers were injured and over 100 were hospitalized. The police did little to help the marchers, and following a congressional investigation, the police chief was fired. Local journalists Ida Houston Harper and Esther Griffin White believed that the violence of this event would actually bring sympathy to the cause of suffrage. Meanwhile, in Indianapolis, the reason why the Indiana delegation in DC was so small is because they had planned a simultaneous march at the State House on March 4, 1913. From the Indianapolis Star, quote, while the women's suffrage army was fighting its way up Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington yesterday, Indianapolis suffragists were besieging the Indiana, Indiana Capitol. 500 women flocked to the state house and demanded that the legislature change the state constitution that they may have the right to vote. The women were trying to pin votes for women streamers on the coats of legislators, unquote. And Governor Ralston cheerily, cheerily allowed Luella McWhorter to pin one of her streamers on his coat. The silent protest united the two suffrage groups, the Equal Suffrage Association and the Women's Franchise League at the State House, but any legislation related to women's suffrage was largely ignored. The suffrage movement sputtered after that 1913 parade with starts and stops as the women of the West were receiving enfranchisement, the women in the East were begging for the privilege as shown in this map that was published. In 1914 and 1915, more events were featured for suffrage um, in Indiana and they were more fun events like picnics and pep rallies, tents at the county fair and the state fair and motion picture showings. 300 men and women in Fort Wayne attended a showing of a film entitled, What 80 Million Women Want. The National Franchise League sponsored melting pot days in the spring of 1915. For the entire month of May, local groups collected necklaces, watches, chains, rings, earrings, pins, and even souvenir spoons in a fancy spot on display in stores and clubs in cities around the state. Then the trinkets were collected at the state headquarters, melted down, and exchanged for cash. The Bloomington League posted their pot at the Wiley Art Store and collected about $15 worth of goods, which would be about $400 today. Muncie native Francis Grayson Wilson, who was actually the niece of President Wilson, an entertainer and future aviator, performed for a spellbound audience at the opening of the annual melting pot for the celebration of the Franchise League on May 1st, 1915. Muncie's suffrage days in previous years featured special suffrage movies, picnics, and pep rallies, some hosted by the Ball family. In Kentland, eight young girls had charge of the suffrage automobile melting pot, a beautifully decorated auto flying dozens of votes for women pennants with a huge brass melting pot in front of the car. The girls wore white with suffrage streamers as decoration and carried large bouquets of yellow flowers. The car was driven all over town, passing out invitations to a suffrage day party, which was held at the home of Ada Bush, another prominent state suffrage leader. All the melting pots were donated on June 1st, 1915 at a celebration with delegates and suffrage workers from all over the state at a garden party at the Hotel Severin in Indianapolis. The driver of that auto tour in Hamilton County, Sarah Lauder, sang at the event. Evansville and the North Boulevard branch in Indianapolis had the biggest melting pot contributions. 1916 brought an election year, but by this time Indiana was becoming more organized when forming national delegations and were professionals at special events, 
at the June 7, 1916 suffrage parade in Chicago during the Republican National Convention, Indiana had 70 women march, which was tied for second most after Illinois. Using the same banner from the DC parade, Betsy Edwards, a young suffragist from Shelbyville, carried that Indiana banner. Woodrow Wilson was reelected in the presidential election. Alice Paul, who had organized the DC suffrage parade, again planned for publicity events. Paul organized silent sentinels to stand guard in protest to Wilson at the gates of the White House. At the Grand Picket, the day before Wilson's second inauguration, 1,000 women showed up to circle the White House and they just marched circling around the White House. And in fact, this was the first time ever in history that women or, or anyone protested at the gates of the White House. Groups of women from around the country kept these pickets going. They traveled to Washington DC as reinforcements so that the protests could occur every single day, rain or shine. The protesters, protesters started getting arrested and sent to prison in June of 1917, including Alice Paul. That's where the suffragists also began their hunger strikes. The women's violent treatment at the hands of bystanders, by police and by prison guards was actually starting to change the opinions of Americans who now were sympathizing more for the cause of suffrage. One of the silent sentinels was Nellie Barnes of Indianapolis. Her husband wrote, now, Nellie, I glory in your spunk and courage, knowing as I do that you are working for a grand cause, but please be careful. Nellie Barnes had her banner and took her sentinel spot along the White House gates on November 10th. She told the Indianapolis Press, I may land in jail, but it will be to serve a good cause. She was arrested that day, but released. Days later, Nellie returned to the White House pickets and the scene was more confrontational. This time, Nellie was arrested and sentenced to four days at the notorious Akokan workhouse where other suffragists had been chained to bars and protested with hunger strikes. Here's Nellie with her fellow suffragists at the workhouse. In April of 1917, the U.S. had entered World War I. Suffragists were determined to work patriotically for the war while still demanding their full rights in a democracy. This is why the onlookers at that first um, protest at the White House were frowned upon by, um, for, for protesting. They were considered unpatriotic. But the suffragists argued that their violent treatment at the hands of the police was similar to that of the, quote, evil Huns of Germany, unquote. Nevertheless, the war did delay the suffrage cause. Another unexpected hurdle for suffragists emerged in 1918 and involved one of the most popular state leaders. The president of the Indiana Women's Franchise League was Marie Edwards of Peru, Indiana. She was over six feet tall and had a personality described as buoyant. A graduate of Smith College and from a prominent family, Marie Edwards was typical of suffragists from Indiana. She supported the more mainstream suffrage movement carefully keeping away from the more radical factions like Alice Paul's picketing sentinels. But there was one thing that she couldn't keep away, Spanish influenza. When World War I started, Edwards managed her husband's furniture company when he went to war. In October of 1918, she was lobbying the US Senate for suffrage in Washington DC along with Carrie Chapman Cass. When she returned to Indiana, she missed the Franchise League meetings and speaking engagements after being struck with influenza. Carrie Chapman Catt was also stuck in bed with the flu at the same time. Marie Edwards actually traveled to French Lick to recover. And by Thanksgiving, she was literally back in business attending a chair exhibition in New York for her family business. When the war ended in November of 1918, Suffragists believed they would be rewarded with the vote thanks to their hard war work, but instead more delays happened. So once again, suffragists decided to pick it outside the White House, this time burning speeches of President Wilson in an urn. Lucille Combs of Princeton, Indiana, was one of 22 suffragists arrested and jailed for participating in these, quote, watchfire, unquote, demonstrations. 
Fun fact, Alice Paul awarded prison cell pins to suffragists who were jailed, and Lucille Combs' pin is actually displayed in the Smithsonian along with Alice Paul's. But finally, though, the women had gained momentum and Congress passed the 19th Amendment in the spring of 1919 to be sent to the states for ratification. When Speaker of the House Frederick Gillette signed the 19th Amendment on June 4th, 1919, there were two Indiana women in the room where it happened. Ida Houston Harper and Molly Garrett Hay. Governor James Goodrich praised state lawmakers on January 16, 1920 for their efforts to, quote, free the women of America from the last vestige of political disability, unquote. The House ratified the measure in Indiana within 15 minutes of the Senate vote. Fourteen suffragists attended the official signing ceremony at the Indiana State House. Mrs. Harry Buckland of Brazil, Elizabeth Beardsley of Elkhart, Mrs. G.C. Markle of Winchester, Olga Stilwell and Mrs. Frank Kimmel of Anderson, Marie Edwards, who we saw um, from Peru, Sarah and Eldina Lotcher, and Mrs. E.F. White from Indianapolis, Helen Benbridge, Mrs. Frank Kimball, Mrs. C.A. Butler, Mrs. Sue Krogh, Sarah Messing Stern, and Mae Homer, all of Terre Haute. They were all present for the signing from Governor Woodard. Uh, Goodrich. And women were literally dancing in the streets and dancing in the, in the state house. Tennessee was the final state needed and ratified the amendment, for the, the 19th Amendment, by one vote by a young Harry Byrne in August of 1920. And suffragists celebrated again. In Anderson and Fort Wayne, factory whistles blew at noon. Fort Wayne also dropped leaflets uh, on the city from airplanes and church bells rang in Indianapolis. On one day in September, more than 30,000 women in Indianapolis alone registered to vote. In the country, 26 million women were added to the voting rolls. The new League of Women Voters, which had just been created about six months earlier, held a series of educational sessions called Voter School. And by November, the women of Anderson had already organized meetings in every part of the city to campaign against a candidate for prosecutor. Dr. Anita Morgan tells the story of that fateful election day. November 2nd, 1920 was unseasonably cold and snowy, but despite the conditions that day, the, the Indiana had the largest voter turnout in history for that time. Women in New Albany wore, I will vote by 10 pins, in Greenfield, at all 11 precincts, a woman was the first voter. In South Bend, almost all of the 38,477 registered women voted. In Lafayette, the nuns from St. Elizabeth Hospital marched in solemn procession to the polls. But this, I think, is the most remarkable statistic. In Indianapolis, 93% of the 76,000 registered women voted for the first time in their life. 93%. In every presidential election since 1980, the proportion of eligible female adults who voted has exceeded the proportion of eligible male adults who voted, and the number of female voted, voters has exceeded the number of male voters in every presidential election since 1964. In the end, women won the vote by sustaining both moderate and militant strategies that rare combination of the idealistic and the practical. A little Nellie Barnes spunk, Esther Griffin White unapologetic, unapologetic sass, Josephine Pearson diligence, Harriet McClellan confidence, Catherine Beveridge style, Anna Dunn Nolan organization, Madam C.J. Walker savvy, Marie Edwards multitasking and stamina, and Ida Houston Harper dedication. And I think this is a good quote to end the program. Um, Julia Nelson was the first woman elected to the state legislature on that day in 1920. And this is what she had to say about getting elected as the first woman. 
So does anybody have any questions? Let me look at the chat. Oh yeah, the, if, if Susan B. Anthony, she may have spoken in Zionsville, that, that map that I made was just for that one um, tour that she took in 18, I think that was 1887. So that was just for that one particular tour because I know I found other records where she was in Crawfordsville, she was in Richmond a couple of times. So she probably did speak in Zionsville, but that was just for one particular tour of that map. It's pretty specific. Do we have any other questions? I'm also, um, we have a pretty small group, so I think it would be fine if you just um, wanted to unmute yourself and ask a question or ask in the chat. Um, either one would be totally fine. <laughs> I don't have a question, but I just thought it was interesting how all these women that were so active in the movement are from small towns, you know, like Logansport and Peru and Elkhart, and Evans, well, Evansville is not really small, but it, you know, you didn't talk about a lot of women from Indianapolis. Yeah, and it, it's, it's, I, and I overlook so many women, but it's kind of surprising that the really small towns, like even Sulphur Springs, which is a really tiny town here close to Muncie, they had a women's franchise league. And it's just crazy to think, and Muncie had seven um, women franchise leagues just in, in one city. They had two African-American women franchise league. And the very first women's rights convention in Indiana was a really tiny town called Dublin in Eastern Indiana. It was a little Quaker uh, town. The Quakers were very involved in the early suffrage movement. So it's, it was, it's really surprising. That's why my map has gotten really kind of out of hand because there's so many tiny little towns that have a story that are related to suffrage. Co so it's kind of exciting. What lessons from the suffrage movement do you think apply today in achieving transformative social political change? I think just there, I mean, everyone uses that quote, nevertheless, they persisted. That I was just so surprised by how they just kept, I, I um, the map that's behind me is one of the suffrage maps that I made and it features um, lightning bugs, fireflies, and that's kind of how I picture Indiana suffrage. It's like there would be a bright light and then it would go dark. And then, so something good would happen and then there would be a setback. And, but they were so, so determined. And this was three generations of women that just kept going. And when I saw that 93% of the women in Indianapolis voted that very first day, that was just like, it just warmed my heart. Like things like that just like really um, give me inspiration. And I'm hoping that with everything that's happening in the world, we can be inspired by those women uh, from 100 years ago and, and know that our voice is really important. Have you done a map uh, up for Elizabeth Cady Stanton? I have not. I, I need to do more research. But like I said, when I start researching one woman, I find other women and I find multiple ideas for maps. So right now I'm up to seven maps that I've made. Um, just with different topics. Most of the topics are the topics that I covered tonight. Like um, I mapped out who was in the DC March. Um, I mapped out where they had the melting pot um, celebrations across Indiana. So most of the, the topics that I covered tonight are a map and I'll send you the links um, when I get your email. Were there any other women elected that first day? I. I think there were some women um, in Indianapolis that were elected to school, the school board um, that very first day. Um, the story about Julia Nelson, the first woman elected to the, the state house that day, the man who was running for that office actually died the weekend before the election. So her name, her name was written in and, and she was a Republican. So, um, and the Republicans want, pretty much did a, a landslide in Indiana for that election. So. That's how she won, was she, her name was written in. She was the writing candidate for the Republicans. But she was a character. She was pretty adamant for women's suffrage as well. Any other questions at all? Sorry for the dog noise in the background. <laughs> <laughs> um, so 
Um, I did want to mention that, again, this program, um, we partnered with the League of Women Voters to bring Melissa, um, much delayed, but, um, and I thought Lisa Dick, the current president of the Hamilton County League of Women Voters, would be here this evening to talk slightly about the League, um, just a minute or two, and then also talk about some of their resources. And not to put you on the spot, Peg Harmon, yeah. um, I didn't know if you would be willing to do the same or if you want me to um, just do the quick of what I know. <laughs> okay, I, yeah, I was kind of surprised that I didn't see Lisa here tonight. So, um, uh, sure, um, I, we have a few other members here who, if, they're, if they want to, feel free to chime in. And um, so there is a League of Women Voters in Hamilton County. And as um, Melissa pointed out, uh, the League of Women Voters was formed kind of at the tail end of the suffrage movement. It actually sort of kind of came out of the suffrage movement. And um, so we've been around since uh, 1920 or thereabouts. And um, and pretty much are interested in voter voter rights, voter education. We're a um, nonpartisan group. We do not endorse any political parties or any candidates. Um, we're just really interested in people being educated voters and uh, being able to vote. Um, but we do have a Facebook page if you want inf more, more information about our group. So if you just go to Facebook and we're in there as the League of Women Voters of Hamilton County, Indiana. Um, we have just uh, started a new application which will be, which, which will allow us to have a Facebook page, but I don't know that that's actually up and running at this, at this time or not. Linda, do you is it a, is it available now or are we still putting that together no it's available our new website is lwvhcin.org so league of women voters hamilton county indiana lwvhcin.org and it is up and running as of last week we're we're busy populating it but it's getting going okay thank you linda so um, yeah, there is more information there about the league available on that website or on in Facebook. So, um, and also, go ahead. Oh, sorry, Peg. Um, I was just also going to um, quickly, um, on the mention of voter education in the league, um, mention if you have not already early voted, um, they have a wonderful voter resource that um, has candidate information provided by the candidates, um, and that is vote411.org. Is that correct, Peg? Yeah, that is correct, and thank you very much for remembering yeah. that, yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, um, and if you are interested in the links that Melissa mentioned, um, you should all have my email address. Um, I was, Sarah, I'm the one who emailed you um, the information for this evening's program and how to log in via Zoom. So if you just want to respond back to that and say, hey, send me the links, I will make sure that you um, receive the links from Melissa. Does anybody have any other last questions for Melissa or for um, our league members who are here this evening? All right, well. Um, I don't have a question, but it was a really, really nice program. I appreciate yeah. it. It's Thank great. you so much. Yes, I thought it was, a, I thought it was very nice too. There, PBS did something on women's suffrage. They have a, a program. I think it was a two part series that yeah. was very, very good. And I thought this was really nice, Melissa, because you pointed out these Indiana women and participating in these programs that are also mentioned in that thing. Other, right. So I kind of brought that home. Yeah, that, I was that, so surprised to see so yeah. many women involved in all those national events. Mm -hmm. 
Unfortunately, I haven't found any pictures of the Indiana delegation at that parade. I have a friend who works at the Library of Congress, and I'm going to tell her to go digging and see if she can find something. Mm -hmm. That would be nice. Yeah. Well, thanks everyone for coming. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you everyone for coming. Thank you. And you might also um, check out the Indiana Humanities Suffrage Centennial website. Um, I know some other libraries are doing virtual events and that's the one great thing about virtual events is you can attend from anywhere. So there might be other speakers um, still doing these presentations around the state that you could possibly attend virtually. Um, and of course, I, the library, we really appreciate you attending. Um, keep an eye on our calendar for more events this winter. And we are open now at our temporary location um, at Merchant Square at the Old Marsh Building. So come and visit us in person if you'd like. All right. Well, thank you everybody so much. And I hope you have a wonderful evening. And thank you, Melissa. And thank you, um, League members, for being here this evening. <laughs>